Thanks. Not only is it going to be on HTML5, but it's going to be the five keys to success for HTML5. Because five is a magic number. You know, it's like a little pun I'm trying to play there. Um, so thanks for coming to my talk. I'm starting a little bit early, which means that I don't have to rush so much through these slides. And hopefully I'll leave a little bit of time for some questions. Um, my background is I'm Jesse Freeman, as I was just introduced. I'm a developer evangelist at Amazon. And my job really is to help people make games and publish it to our platform. The former being I really want to help people make really good games. And the latter of getting you on our platform is icing on the cake. So I put my email up. I'm on the Twitter as Jesse Freeman. And if you have a game or you're working or something or you're at a company where you have really great games and you want to publish them to our platform, please email me directly. Or if you need some advice or looking into how to get something up and running, always try happy to help. So that being said, um, how many people have never heard of HTML5? All right, it's the savior of mobile gaming. It works like native across all platforms. Um, the, the whole idea of HTML5 gaming is a very sound one. And so my background before getting into HTML5 was I did a lot of Flash development. I've actually done native. I've done all kinds of stuff. But going from Flash to HTML5 seemed like a really logical choice when Flash was in a tailspin around the drain and getting into these big heated Twitter arguments with Adobe about what the future of Flash was with the iPhone. So I jumped on the bandwagon really early on to get into HTML5 because I wanted my games to work on mobile. But being a web developer, I wanted my games to also work on the web. And what's really good about this is that there's a huge community that supports HTML5 games. And a lot of these engines are open source. And what's great about this is that not only can you get the source, but you can actually go through and modify it and tweak it. So some of the top ones on the here are ImpactJS. So this is the one that I first started doing. Um, and I've actually gone through and gutted the whole framework and put it back together again and optimized it for my own games. And Phaser is a new one that's coming up as well that's really popular. And then the list goes on and on until you get into even stranger and more interesting flavors of game frameworks like GameMaker, which is a proprietary language, but it outputs to HTML5, as well as stuff like Construct2, which is a web which allows you to you drag and drop web-based games. So because of the power of HTML5 games, all the games that I've built can all be played on my website. And I have a link up. It's games.jessefreeman.com. And these aren't really amazing or in-depth games, but they are just proof of concepts and stuff that I've built. And the way that I got around it is this game jam called One Game a Month. And the idea behind... Thank you. <laughs> the <laughs> See, they like One Game a Month, too. The idea behind One Game a Month is exactly what it sounds like. Build a game each month. And it's a lot harder than it sounds like. Uh, <laughs> but it teaches you some really interesting things. So for me, it was about quickly exploring and prototyping ideas, uh, also being able to focus on only the core game mechanics. So when you have to build a game each month and you work for a company and you travel as much as I do, uh, it's very hard to build a full featured game. But I learned quickly that I could just focus on one little idea, like I'm going to make a runner, or I'm going to make a platformer, or this or that, and just start building on top of that. Then. You also learn how to work under pressure. So I also work for agencies, and I know how it is to build a huge website in about two weeks with intense deadline and no way to actually get it done. So building games under this time frame seemed kind of natural too. And then also finding the motivation to complete a game because you always get stuck in this perfection loop where you want to just build something perfect and you can't move on. So once you do that, you actually gain the experience to publish more and more games. And all of this kind of got summarized into this talk. So the first lesson that I learned was how to create, refine, and iterate. And this is really important because making a game is a never-ending process. And by that, I have these to-do lists. And they get really, really long. And I just try to work on pieces of them at a time and check off what I can do. And, you know, games, if you're building a game for yourself, since there's no real client or there's no real end to it, it can just go on and you can get immense amount of scope creep. So it's really important to be able to manage your time and the features that you want to put into these games. So as an example, I'll roughly prototype something out. So I have an art background. This isn't the best of my art. But what I've learned is that I can still do pixel art and spend all this time. But the more time that I spend doing the artwork, I have less time to do the actual game. 
So what I did is I go through and I actually started finding pixel artists who will go through and build the artwork for me. And it frees me up. And while it's, you know, not everyone has a budget for it, there are some really, you know, um, inexpensive people you can get in other countries to do the artwork. The thing is, is that I'm able to actually focus on the game itself. So here I've redone uh, the artwork and worked with an artist uh, to do it. And the game looks a thousand times better. And I also went through and actually simplified the entire gameplay mechanics from the original game. And really, to sum this up, I I this part is that no matter what you build, you shouldn't give up. And I love this picture of this guy who's just sweeping a parking lot for no reason. Because it's like an endless, pointless job. And that last like 10% of making a game is incredibly difficult. But once you get you know, to the point where you're actually able to publish it, you, know, you should never give up. Just keep pushing for that goal. Make that parking lot shine. Um, the next lesson I learned is to design for mobile first. So even down to when I start looking at the resolutions, I always think about the mobile resolution first. And the, reason I and the reason I actually went to HTML5 is because I want my games to be playable inside of web browsers. To me, that's like the holy grail because everyone has a mobile phone and every phone has a web browser on it and every desktop has a browser. And if you put all those together, that's a huge base to play games. So... The thing is, is that trying to actually support all these different resolutions on different computers, all the way from computers down to phones, is incredibly difficult. So the way that I think about it is instead of resolutions, I actually tackle the problem as aspect ratios. And so from here, I manage two different types of aspect ratios, a 16 by 9 and a 4 by 3. And then from there, I'm able to scale the game up and down based on which the device is and try to get the game to look as good as possible. Th this is more of a problem on my end because I do pixel art games and I want the pixel art to always look crisp. So your mileage may vary. If you're doing more like vector-based stuff or vector looking like illustration stuff, you can get away with this a lot easier than, than I can on pixel art. So, and I made this template uh, when I worked at Microsoft and this still holds true today and this is sort of my thinking behind it is that the, the center red square is 800 by 480 and this is sort of my natural generic androidish phone resolution and from there it's a 4 by 3 aspect ratio i can go up to a 1020 uh 1024 by 768 uh resolution and then i can also go up to a 16 by 9 but what you'll see is that the actual resolution is in parentheses but the real resolution is a lot lower so when i'm at a 1024 by 768 i'm really at 800 by 600 and the reasoning behind this is that in order for you to get a canvas game to scale all the way up from a mobile phone to a 27-inch desktop, you have to actually scale canvas. You can't run it at native resolution. So I have a cap at each of these aspect ratios that when the game goes to a certain aspect ratio and a certain size, I actually just scale the entire canvas up. And of course, I get blurriness. Uh, I can't get around that, but I, uh, I don't get a drop in performance. Also, you need to optimize and compress everything. If you're targeting mobile, and especially where it's really big in Asia and Europe where mobile gaming is really hot, like mobile game portals, you have to make sure that everything is as small as possible. So luckily, because audio is still an issue on mobile phones playing games, you can skip kind of a lot of the audio stuff, but at least the images and the artwork and the CSS should all be optimized. And one way I get around this also is that I use texture atlases. So you might be familiar with sprite sheets, and generally the sprite sheet is where you take a whole bunch of artwork and you line it up in a grid and then you cut it out. Well, texture atlases are even better than that because it allows you to take all the artwork and put it into a single image. And then from there you have an atlas, which is basically a JSON file in my case that lets me know where the coordinates are and I can pull out each of the artwork individually. And this way I've gone from having maybe 30 images in my game that are different sprite sheets down to one image. And then I can run that through a compression and I can actually optimize that even further. Um, even better is that I can actually take the JSON data and then I can inject that into my game and optimize that when I compress my game. So as many layers of compression as I can get, I'm trying to do. And that sort of brings me to automating. So I, in addition to, if, <laughs> if I actually listed off all the places I've worked and done, I've had a very varied career, but I've also done enterprise. And the biggest things I learned from enterprise development is that you need to automate. And I use that in my games. And I, I love this quote. I've used this in every talk I've ever done about automation, which is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And we work on computers day in and day out. Let them do the heavy lifting for us. So 
with that in mind, I go through and I have these automation scripts that build out my games for me. And I use them to optimize and package up the game. I use them to deploy them to multiple platforms. And then I also use them to have a reproducible build process. There's nothing worse than having a game that you give over to another developer and they can't figure out how to run it. And we all think that web games are kind of easy to build because they just run on any server, but every web developer wants to do it a different way, on a different type of server, on a different type of setup, and a different type of blah, 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 and it just goes on indefinitely. But if I give them a package and say, here, run this one script and it'll set everything up for you, we're all on the same page. So with that, because it's web games, I actually leverage web technology. So I use stuff like Node.js in order to run and host my games. I use stuff like Grunt, which goes through and lets me able to automate this. Uh, and then moving through these quickly as I'm looking at the time is being able to analyze your games. Um, you should always know what's going on in each of your games. And if you're building web games, always use analytics. I put Google Analytics into a lot of my web games. This way I know at every stage what's going on, which pages are being viewed, which pages are not being viewed. And from there, I'm able to see, well, I can't have play tests for every single person in person like I did in this particular scenario. But through stats, I'm able to see that only 38% of the people who are actually playing my game are finishing it. And this actually lets me help figure out my balancing issues. So are people making it to the store? What are people buying? When are they buying it? When are people dropping off of the game? Do they even care? Do they make it past the first level? And then also bugs. I have a boss battle every five levels. I see that everyone hits the boss battle the first time, but they don't hit it after that. But I still see stats that they're making it to further levels, so I clearly have a bug in my game. And this kind of stuff, as an individual developer, can help you scale really quickly. And then the last part of this is about releasing early and releasing often. And the real thing about making games is that it's not about making the perfect game. Um, it's about making as many games as possible and getting good at it. It's just like any other skill, anything else you do or work out, you know, you have to build up your muscles to be a good game developer and a good game designer. So the more you build, the better you get at it. Um, also with releasing often, we can actually take advantage of what we call the long tail. And this is, you know, a big boring quote, but the real idea behind the long tail is when you release something, there's a huge pickup and then it drops off. And you'll see here in this stat that every time I do an update to my game, I get a pickup and a drop off, a pickup and a drop off. So continuing to update the game actually improves people playing them and keeping them there. The last part about distributing is that still making, uh, distributing HTML5 games is still kind of a mess. Um, <laughs> it's all over the place and no one has a real answer to it yet. Um, you can do it on the web. You can use Cocoon.js, which is a really good the kind of native like wrapper. Um, you can use PhoneGap. And then at Amazon, we have something called the Amazon Web Packager. And what this allows you to do, and we got this quote from, uh, from Tim Tay, who I think is floating around here from Kano Apps. And he literally was able to open up a Kindle Fire, turn it on, plug it to the internet, and then put his game on the device immediately. And the way that we do that is by we made it super easy for web developers to publish with us. All you have to do is you download our web app tester and you put in the URL to where your game is. So you actually keep your game online where you normally would and then we package it up for you on our store and we put it up next to the native games. And you'd have no idea because it runs at high performance because we've optimized the web view specifically for running web apps and web games on our platform. So once you test it out, it just looks like any other native app. I already have controls because I'm planning for mobile anyway, so my game shows up on my controls. And then once you have to do that, you're ready to submit the game and you fill out all the basic metadata you normally would. But instead of uploading a zip, you simply just put in your URL. And so if you want to get more information about it, uh, we have it at developer.amazon.com slash web app. And again, we've gone through and we support WebGL, we've optimized the web render so that it runs incredibly fast. And also, we support Cordova. So if you're using Cordova now to publish your apps and your games, you're able to actually take advantage of our web app, um, our web app uh, tools and the optimized web view. So with that, I just wanted to thank everyone for listening to me ramble on for a few minutes of uh, HTML5. And happy to answer any quick questions if anyone has it. Uh, and also check out our, our portal. It's developer.amazon.com slash public. And we have all kinds of articles and posts about all the stuff that we do at Amazon. Any questions? Oh. 
Yeah, hey, we gotta wait for the mics. Fight, fight, fight. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, Craig Robinson, Absolute Hero. Uh, you talked about handling different um, aspect ratios. Uh, how do you handle uh, portrait versus landscape rotations? I only build landscape games. I okay. cheat. Because at the end of the day, I want to go to desktop and I want all my games to be at that resolution. I also design for like, in my head, I want my games to run on console. So I, I think about that. Um, it's a tough one. You have to pick one and stick with it. Hey, Jesse, this is Brian Wayne from Game Cloud. Hi. Fellow, well, Brooklynite. You're in New York. I'm in New York. Right? Yeah. Brooklyn in the house. Brooklyn. Um, as far as the Amazon web applications, uh, as far as the games go, A, are you seeing, what kind of adoption are you seeing? And B, in terms of monetization, are there any sort of limits in terms of ads or anything else that, or logins or anything that we should be aware of? Um, so adoption, people who've used it, love it. I mean, th what better way can you just keep your game already where you have it and then just give the URL to put it on? Which adoption are you talking about? The actual tool or? The users, like what kind of numbers are you seeing in terms of distribution of the applications? So numbers, I don't have exact numbers on. Um, but to the other part of your... Bigger than a bread box? Definitely bigger than a bread box. <laughs> um, there's a lot of HTML5 developers out there. Um, I think a lot of what we're trying to do is educate them just that this tool exists. I don't think many people know that this sort of exists. Uh, but now, and I've totally sidetracked. What was the second part of your question? Which is adoption and then... Oh, okay. So ads. Do we have to show ads. Amazon, Amazon ads? Do we okay. have to, do we, do we have to use the Amazon payment system for microtransactions? Like um, if we have our own, uh, you know, login and uh, something like that community, is that a problem? Sure. So it's just a web view, right? So whatever you're using on your website or your game currently will work exactly how it is. We've whitelisted specific, very popular ones so that there's no problem. Um, the other side of it is that you can actually sell the app. So if you wanted to sell it for a dollar, you can sell it. Um, you can use in-app purchases through our APIs. Um, and then you can use whatever ads you're currently using for your web games. Uh, in-app purchases do have to be through our APIs. Um, that is, if you, wanted to, if you wanted to tie in, I mean, the advantage of why you publish with our platform is that we have this huge ecosystem called Amazon.com, and there's a lot of people who use it, so you take advantage of the fact that we have that integrated into our devices. Uh, Jesse, I just wonder how uh, feasible is it to create a 3D game for HTML5? So it is currently feasible. So we support WebGL in this, and uh, I think you know the biggest thing about WebGL right now is just the tooling, but we've been talking with a bunch of partners who are building like Play Canvas and all these people who are building these like web-based tooling for it, but you can use WebGL, it's fully supported. Goo, I think we met with the Goo guys a while back and their stuff is already running on it, so there's a lot of, uh, th th that definitely should work. So any tool you can suggest, like one or two tools? Uh, WebGL tool, rather than direct coding? The WebGL tools? Yeah. Um, the w uh, there's a bunch of different WebGL tools out there. Like, I don't know all of them off the top of my head that are compatible, but I know there's a bunch of companies now that are trying to solve the tooling problem for building 3D games. Okay. But we support WebGL, so. Cool, and kind of a follow-on to that. So do you use any frameworks? Like, um, I think it, Impact I saw on your site? Or so I use Impact, and I use Phaser, and I played around with a bunch of different ones. Um, any preference between those two? Or I really, really, really liked uh, Impact for a very long time, but... Um, it, there hasn't been a lot of progress on it. Like Impact 2 is supposed to be coming out and it's $100, so it's like a steep buy for a lot of people. I think it's well worth the money. Um, Phaser is probably it. Richard Davey writes it and it's, he's an awesome developer, good friends with him and one of the best frameworks out there and, it's, and it covers everything. And if you come from like Flixel or Flash, it's a port of that framework. So it's a natural progression from going from Flash to HTML5. Any other questions? No? No, like, curveball questions? Like, what's my favorite color? Yellow, no blue. Okay, well, then, thanks very much. And, uh, again, uh, my email is just freej, that's my rapper name, at Amazon, freej at Amazon.com. So if you have anything you want to share or questions or, you know, other stuff like that, feel free to send me an email. Thanks.